I do business in like I mail all over the U.S. There's not a single state that I cut out. I have deals in Virginia right now. I've done stuff in Ohio. So my work around this is I hire the real estate agents. So that way, nobody can accuse me of practicing real estate without a license because my realtor, he's licensed. And he's the one that's finding the buyer, working with escrow, getting it closed. So, you know, for me, that there's, there's really no risk anymore. So he takes his percentage based on the sale price or based on your assignment oh, fee? He takes the percentage based off the sale price. And we just do like a back-to-back -back closing. Again, there's no law that says you can't have two files open on the same property. So the escrow company, they'll open up two files. And whether you sell a property next day or you sell it after a week or after a year, it really doesn't matter. As long as it's separate deals, it, that's that's all that matters, right? So that's been my workaround and it's worked for me. I've, I haven't run into a single state where I have not been able to wholesale. So, so when you do yeah. the double, double closing, do you have to um, sell with cash? Because I've, I've ran into a couple scenarios where the lender of the buyer won't close until I've owned the property for enough time to them, for them to then start their due diligence appraisal process, whatever that is. I rarely sell to buyers with lenders. Most of the buyers, uh, they buy land for with cash and then they get financing for the construction costs, but that's separate. They do that after they close. But I have run into that situation once where a buyer did have a lender and the lender did want to see me that I owned it. So we just came to an agreement where I would hold title for two days and then the lender would close. And I, I was comfortable uh, in that scenario. We've done a couple to where it's been back to back and there was a lender involved on the final sale price. And we just have a disclosure that we'll use the end buyer's funds to do the initial purchase. And uh, the title company gave us that document. So then if the lender had any questions about that, they just directed it directly to the title company. So the title company was the one answering all their questions about that. It was kind of less about us. So it made it seem a little bit more legitimate when the title company was the one making those conversations and stuff. So we have a, a document that says this is going to be a cash sale on the end side and a lender one on the final sale side and if it's if there's a lender involved there's just another line that the lender has to sign that disclosure also was that in uh, like in illinois tim or somewhere else yeah yep or yep we've we, we've only done those in in illinois uh we'd like to branch out but that's all that we've done so far that's great to know for some reason i always thought when uh when lenders were involved, like it just doesn't work period, but it sounds yeah. like it's not the case for you. It's caused some, you know, a lot of question marks, but we're upfront with the buyers, you know, like what our whole, like what we're doing, like, Hey, this makes it a little bit easier for us paperwork wise, if we do it this way. So they know, then they're talking to their bank. And then if the bank has any questions, they talk to the title company. And whenever we do our initial purchase agreement with the owner, uh, we just include that document in there that says, hey, we're going to use the end buyer's funds to do this purchase if we kind of get that far. So it's just kind of included in our packet, you know, and it kind of becomes an issue if you make it an issue. So if you kind of make it and just kind of talk about it like, all right, and then page seven is this, and then page eight is this. And I don't know, it kind of helps a little bit navigate through that. So your seller is signing that disclosure. Yes, yeah, so we have two two disclosures. We have one with the original owner that says, hey, we're going to use the end buyer's funds on this to pay you out. And then we have another disclosure that says to the end buyer, we're going to use your funds and we're going to make money on this whole transaction. And we're going to use your funds for the initial purchase and we're going to get some type of profit from that. So it's kind of some wording and stuff in there. But I can, I don't know, Seth, if there's a way that I could... Well, I, I could I could email you the two documents at least that we use here in Illinois. Yeah, that'd be um, awesome. Yeah, and then yeah, you know, if you'd want to share it with the group, but yeah. um, yeah, but it's it's been really helpful for us. My question is so like I've had deals where lender was comfortable with me wholesaling. They knew the business model. They were fine with it. They closed, and then more recently, I had a sale in a different state where the lender was involved, and this lender was so particular that, like, unless you know, our, like, our bank won't allow us to close until we verify with the county that you own the property, and uh, like, it doesn't matter what the buyer wants, what I want. Like, the lender was just very particular about owner's title policy, deed, verifying with the county, and so there had to be that two-day lag. So I'm just wondering if your situation would have still worked like how would you navigate a situation like that yeah it sounds like that was a lot more lender driven you know so at least the ones that we've had the lender didn't dig their feet in and make that an issue so i think if it was then we would have had to come up with different funding you know to be able to do that initial purchase and then we would have been the owner for you know a couple minutes but typically on our wholesale deals and we, we've not done a ton like we've maybe done 
10 of them maybe on the land side, but the ones that we've done the double closing on, and that's kind of mainly all of them, just so we kind of hide our assignment fee, probably about half of them is in, have been with a lender and we haven't really had that issue. And, and I feel like it's a little bit more helpful when the title company has that discussion with them instead of me having that discussion with the buyer and then the buyer having that discussion with the with the bank, you know. Hey, Tim, you were saying that you kind of hide your assignment fee. Um, is, is, is it ever a problem that the seller finds out that you're like, you know, doubling the price to the buyer and that you're making a killing on their property? We've not had that issue um, yet, but we're a hundred percent upfront with the, like whenever we're getting these under contract, we are a hundred percent saying that we are not the buyer on this property. We're going to advertise it for hire. And then if we find a buyer, then we get the spread. I've kind of you heard. Did, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. I've, you did mention that you use the phrase, we hide what you're making. You use oh, that. Right. How do you do that? And yeah. So just with the double closing, you know, so if we have a property under contract for 20 and then we find a buyer at 50, we'll buy it at 20. So the initial owner gets what they asked for. And then we end up selling it to the end buyer then for 50. So then we would get the spread between those two minus all the closing costs for two transactions in that. But we've we've not had any issues where the original owner looked up on the county website and then saw what it sold for and then, you know, relayed back to us. They were just happy to get rid of it. And if they were going to do all that work to find out what we actually made, then they probably would have tried to sell it on their own anyways. Right. In that particular example, that you owned it for a little bit. When you say you owned it, did, yeah. did you have to put in your own cash for that to buy it for that moment? No, that's where uh, I was talking about those disclosures. So what we typically will do is we'll have the original owner sign a disclosure that says, we're going to use the end buyer's funds to buy it. And then we'll have the end buyer sign a document that says, your funds for this purchase are going to be used for the initial purchase with the original owner. So then we use the end buyer's funds for it. So, so, so the length of ownership for us is just the time it takes us from signing one document that says we bought it to then signing the next document that said we sold it. So we try to schedule those closings for the same same day, same time. And typically the sellers and the end buyers are not there. So they're mailing all the documents in and all that kind of stuff. So it's not like we're sitting across the table from these people. So theoretically for those few minutes, you actually own the property right. with, and the other guy bought it for you. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. We're on the chain of title. So clever. I'm always amazed at how clever people are. So the seller, the buyer and the lender all sign some kind of disclosure, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. the buyer and seller don't see specific numbers. They don't see the other person's HUD or anything like that. Right. Got yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Pretty cool. It, but, but we're a hundred percent transparent that we're making money on the deal. They just don't know necessarily how much and, and depending, you know, if we're just doing a small, like assignment fee, like maybe $5,000 and the purchase price is a hundred, then we, we would probably not do that. But you know, if we're, if we're making more than the original owner is making, or if we're making like thirty thousand on a hundred thousand dollar property, we just kind of do it that way, just so it, you know, that, so work. that's not another hurdle. How yeah. many times have you had to try to find a title company that could do this? Like, do you kind of have one that you go back to again and again, or if you had to find a new one, would that be hard? Or? Yeah, really good question. I um, we've only done these in Illinois, so we're like honeymoon phase, you know. <laughs> so it's it we're so we've not done a ton. Like we've maybe done ten uh, of them. But since they're all done in Illinois, doesn't matter what county it is, we use the same title company and they're investor friendly. And they said they'll do wholesale contracts, they'll do double closings and all that kind of stuff. And, and it doesn't matter if it's a house or if it's land. So no pressure, but if you don't mind adding that title company to our closing agent directory nationwide, that'd be pretty good. Oh yeah, good I'd love have. that. Yeah, no, they're they're really good. But I think they only work in, in Illinois. Like I don't think yep. the title companies can go. Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's how our thing is set up. Uh, I'll put a link to it in the chat there. No pressure. It's up to you. But yeah, you can sort them by state. Every time you put a new one in there, you have to see which state they're in and like which okay. maybe which counties they specialize in. So anyway, yeah, that sounds like an awesome one. I don't know what the experience is from other people around here. How often you've tried to shop around for title companies or find ones that are willing to do this stuff. But when I first started trying to do this like 10, 15 years ago, I found it very difficult in my area. Maybe I was explaining it wrong, but like a lot of them were just very difficult to work with. They just wouldn't do any of this stuff. 
stuff, but I know they're out there. I was uh, I was just looking at that list. It doesn't look like Illinois is one of them. So is there a way to make a new? Yep, there's a little button up there that says submit a closing agent. And in that form, when you fill it out, one of the questions oh. is what state they're in. And <laughs> so okay. whenever Sorry a new one that. gets entered in there, it'll just it'll pop it in there. So basically Got that it. means nobody's submitted one from Illinois yet. Got it. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. It was oh, the no biggest problem. button on the page. Yeah. This is uh, Blake. I was just a uh, hey, quick question. So I'm uh, just dipping my toes into the land investing waters here. But um, so Tim was saying that they're a fairly investor friendly title company. Does that mean that sometimes these title companies, when they're not investor friendly, that just means they're not maybe familiar with like land investing in particular, is that why? Or are there other reasons that I'm maybe not thinking of at the moment for why they might not be particularly helpful or investor friendly? I mean, in my experience, it's not so much the land versus houses thing. It's more a matter of uh, hmm. be being willing to do things like double closings and not just double closings, but ones that use the end buyer's funds to pay for everything. That's one I've seen a lot of people getting stuck on or also like assigning deals or um, maybe closing seller finance transactions that are more complicated. A lot of title companies, they're pretty much only willing to do like the super easy stuff, like somebody buying the first house, just, you know, very vanilla. When it comes to anything complex or like something where they have to move really quick or uh, just be nimble in any way, you'll find some of them kind of just put the brakes on, or maybe you hire them and then they just do a terrible job. Like they take a long time to get anything done. So investor friendly is just one that can do a lot of things. Like they're yes men and women, like, yep, we can do it. We can do it, we can do it. They make the process really easy for you. Sometimes you'll see people advertise themselves as investor friendly and not really, it's just a keyword they're trying to rank for on the internet. So it's helpful to know especially from people with experience working with specific ones. Like I had a good experience closing this kind of deal at this title company. And sometimes it's not even so much about the title company as it is about the individual you're working with. Like it's actually that one person who's really good. And then they'll move to some other title company. That's why um, on that form that I was talking about with Tim, one of the questions about the title company is who is the contact person at the title company? Like who exactly should I be asking for when I call them? So anyway, just a quick run through on that. Gotcha. Thank you.